Yo, what's good, Knicks Nation? Welcome back to another Game of the Week preview. Of course, we got a preview game four of the New York Knicks facing the Indiana Pacers. You already know what it is. It's been one hell of a series. It didn't go our way last night, but don't worry. We're going to get right. We're going to get correct. And we're going to get ready for game four. And who better to help me cover and preview this game? None other than Tony East. He covers the Indiana Pacers for many publications. We can also find him at Locked on Pacers. So make sure to tap in, lock in, hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. And make sure to support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KTV to get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Shout out to all the franchise channel members as well. Tony, what's going on, man? Thank you for joining me on this nice, beautiful Saturday morning. Well, I, it's nice out here where I am. I don't know where about you, but I'm sure you're happy, thrilled, especially after that big shot by Andrew Nebhard last night. Yeah, the weather's nice. The hoops are nice. Uh, it's funny. I was talking to somebody from New York who came to Indy for All-Star, and they got snowed on, and it was awful. Then I came to New York for the playoffs, and it was beautiful and 80 every day. Uh, <laughs> so I, I won that exchange for sure, but the nice weather has followed me to Indy. It's been great. Oh, there you go. And then you get you get the nice weather following you to Indy with a a, a a miraculous shot as well. So My let's God. talk about the last night's game, man, because this was a tight one all the way down to the wire. Hal Burton was showing up. Miles Turner, Pascal Siakam, all those guys were doing the damn thing. But, you know, wait until the fourth quarter for five minutes. No team could score. Then you start to see each team start to inch and claw their way to the finish line. But then when you think it would have gone into OT, Andrew Nabar says not today and knocks down that three. Give me your whole perspective on the game and what you thought about that shot getting to that moment. Yeah, it, it reminded me of game one a lot. You know, I think the Pacers were up nine early in the fourth quarter of that game and the Knicks just slowly, you know, drip, 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 drip to come back in the fourth. And every game in this series has kind of been like, it doesn't matter to me at any point in the game if a team is up like five to ten. Like, it's just going to be tied again, you know, like it's just how it's been. So in the fourth, like when the team goes up nine in the fourth, you you're so it's so easy to think, oh boy, you know he this this could be the moment that turns it around. And then the Knicks really struggled for a little bit there, even though they were getting some good looks and Pacers made that comeback. And then the final two minutes, like I'm sure Knicks people hated the block the block by Turner that ended up becoming a huge sequence. I don't know. Uh, I'll get your I'll get your opinion on that in a second. But to have a to have Nemhard hit a shot. Like that in a game where he was over six before the last two minutes of the game um, says a lot about him that he took it even. I mean, they, they botched so much after that offensive rebound to even set that up that that's the best shot they got. But I mean, probably one of the 10 best playoff shots in Pacers history. Reggie Miller, of course, as Knicks fans know, has several of the top three, four, five. But uh, he's up there now in that in that ranking with a shot like that. And on a game where they. I bet the Pacers would say this. That I mean, a lot of the questions after the game were about the final sequence, so no one answered this kind of question. But I bet they would say they didn't even play that well offensively. I mean, they only scored 111 and shot okay from three. But when it mattered, they found enough points in the end. And uh, every game in the series, I think, is going to be like this. There's just something about the universe that keeps the Pacers and Knicks games within, within 10 for all 48 minutes. Epic ending. And I'm sure Miles Turner's block will live in uh, Pacers fan lore for a while, although... I think Knicks fans are uh, not going to call it a block. That's that's what I will say. Yeah, I mean, you got Josh Hart with the comments after the game saying it was a goal 10. I mean, to me, it's so close. It could go so either close. way. I'm just like, I don't even look at it, that aspect. I mean, there was, we could talk about calls, missed calls, and all that type of stuff. It goes for both teams from all series. All series, and, and, and yes. To me, yes. And to me, it's like, I, I can't, this entire 100%. postseason run, I can't focus on the refs too much just because... And I know there's going to be some people like, well, you're a Knicks fan. So you're, you're, you know, you guys have been made it out of the first round. Now you're up to one of the series. So of course you're not worried about that. But even still, like, I understand that the entire season has been up and down with just officiating, whereas the consistency hasn't been there. But when you get, when for a Knicks team that was already up, like you were up nine points, right? And you're in the fourth quarter and then that lead dwindles away. I will get more as an execution standpoint and you well, can't put yourself in that position. I'm sure you would say the same thing about the Pacers over the first two games that you can't yes. put yourself in that position where, Oh, now we got to talk about the refs and what they didn't do. It's like, no, well, you don't want a game to come down to where the refs are making critical decisions for you. So that's how I feel about, about all that. But the, for me, man, the block and all that other type of stuff. I mean, there's even the image of like Siakam holding a uh, heart and oh, It's yeah, just like, it's like, yeah. it's like, it's yeah. like, look, man, it's This stuff's going to happen. Both teams are doing it. You're trying to figure out how you're going to get an edge over the other team. And 
it is what it is at this point. So for for me, I'm looking forward to game four, but I know there's a lot more going on in this game that we're going to talk about. You had Miles Turner's line, right? Like after game one, you know, very easy for the Pacers to, and they did talk about it, but it would have been very easy for them to just make it all about officiating. And Miles Turner said, look, we can't leave it up to that. Like we got to play better, right? That's, they were up nine in the fourth quarter, like the Knicks in game three, like that, they lost because they didn't play well, right? Like as much as this series has been, unfortunately about that, um, both teams know it, right? It, it it shouldn't come down to that. Like if you play better, it won't come down to that. And it's an NBA thing. I hate that it's become such a topic. Like Carl Anthony Towns talking about officiating last night. I'm like, they lost by 30 or something. It's like, right? You just shut up and talk about the games. You know, it, it <laughs> yeah, it man. And that's where it should be because the thing is, like, even up until this point, the games have just been so intense and they've been so good. And yeah, obviously for for I don't know from the Indiana standpoint, you could tell me about how it's transitioned from going against the Bucks to now but for the Knicks it's like you were going against the Sixers which is very defensive oriented really smash mouth on both ends where you're just punching each other in the face and both teams are bloodied up they're looking at each other like who's going to drop first this game has been a, a lot about speed and just who could be the more efficient scoring team and last yeah. night when you look at the Knicks they did everything well offensively but it just came down to the rebound battle especially on the offensive side the offensive glass I mean look the the Pacers beat the Knicks by one board. And I've been saying this every single game. The team that's going to win is going to come down to who gets the most boards, who plays the best defense, who's getting more second chance opportunities. And the Pacers in the fourth quarter were able to do that. I mean, that shot that set up Nemhard, it was two offensive rebounds. Nemhard, you're like, okay, he's going to have to put up a prayer at this point because he's by the logo. And, you know, and then next thing you know, that's what it is. And even get, uh, prior possessions before that you see the Pacers just out hustling and executing at that point but for a Knicks standpoint like we had it we had a chance to to get a better look especially with Brunson who you know he took a and I began a, I began a little bit of heat for this on Twitter because I said that was a baffling shot by Brunson where you see Neesmith foul him on the on the arm and you're like well that was a foul right there I'm like I understand that but when you're watching how the game was going yesterday they were allowing Neesmith and everybody to guard Brunson very physically. And you kind of have to understand as a player, I know it's hard in the moment because you're you're so used to calls at certain points, but you have to make that decision where, okay, they're not giving me this call. I don't think they're going to give you that call at the end with like seconds left on the shot where, oh, he puts up a three, God forbid it go, like not God forbid, but it, let's say it, it, it did go in, you know, you get the three points, you're not going to get the four point play. Oh, it's like it was clear, like in the act of the motion. It was prior before he put up a shot attempt. And I'm like, for me, that's not where. To me, I was like, you had a chance to like get a better look, and I and I'm just, I'm not putting the entire onus on Brunson for that game, because of the last shot. There's other possessions as well, because like I said, they were up nine and things started to, you know, be a, an avalanche afterwards. But for me, like that part of the game at the end, I know there's going to be a good discussion. Like, could you gotten a better shot? He got fouled. To me, man, that's it's it's irrelevant at this point, and it's just I wouldn't take that shot. I wish he did something a little bit better. The thing in these – you nailed the thing to me that has been the same every game until game three. Pacers were up at halftime every game in this series so far, right, uh, even if it's been close. And then in the second half of every game, the Knicks have come out and nixed, <laughs> gotten a bunch of offensive rebounds and up their defensive pressure just a little bit in a way that really changes the game, usually in the third quarter. And they did again. They took a lead in the second half. But this is the first game that the Pacers held on in the rebounding battle, right? They were able to win it, like you already mentioned. And they combined it by winning the turnover battle by three. So not only are they changing the possession game with the boards, they're doing it with turnovers as well. And so the Knicks had four more free throws, so that's probably two possessions. But the Pacers took nine more shots in the game, right, just from the field. right? That is a huge advantage that comes from the possession battle that they haven't really had throughout the series because the Knicks are so good on the glass. I think in the regular season, the Knicks were first in rebound rate and Pacers were 26th, right? Like that was obviously going to be a thing in this series. So finally the Pacers are able to compete in that way. Miles Turner credit to him, six offensive boards for him. And that might be a, it's definitely a playoff career high. I'd have to look at his entire career. That was really huge and stabilizing them in the second half in a way that wasn't the case before. And I think part of that's just like, it's harder to force misses that you can rebound when OG's not playing, and he himself is a good rebounder too for the Knicks, so that's a factor. But I'm curious what you think, why they didn't dominate the glass so much because they still did have 10 offensive boards. Like It's not like it was 
pathetic or anything. It just wasn't quite as nixy, for lack of a better term, in the second half. Yeah, I think getting to 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 the meat of it is just look, Josh Hart, our best rebounder without Julius like on, oh on the court. He's just fantastic, right? Six four shooting guard. How, how, how is it, man? This dude's like Dennis Rodman when it comes to like rebounding the ball. I mean, obviously it's much different. Rodman being an actual forward, what Hart is doing is just so impressive. But to me, I think the biggest thing in the down that stretch of the game is that we didn't have Precious out there, and I thought Precious did a solid job guarding Pascal Siakam. I think for Tibbs, because you saw that your offense was so stagnant for those five minutes, you're like, we need to get a bucket. Brunson's not having it tonight. They're allowing Naismith to be very physical on Brunson last night, so it was it made him a little uncomfortable. And, and Burks was cooking, so he left him in. Right, and so yeah. I get that. I get that. They also brought McBride back in, who was he was okay. It was better than what he did in the first two games. Still waiting for him to do what he did against the Philadelphia 76ers. But for me, I, I would have liked to seen, I guess, uh, instead of McBride, maybe go with Precious because Precious could have given you that more height. He was yeah. doing a solid job. He got you six boards in 22 minutes. Uh, four offensive rebounds as well, by the way. He, him and Hartenstein were leading on that end of the floor. And for Precious to get four offensive rebounds in 22 minutes when Hartenstein did that in 39. You know, I thought maybe you wanted to go with a little bit more height because that's how he started the game. Maybe that's how you close the game. And Precious was, like I said, having a decent game yesterday too. I, I wish he did play at some point in the fourth quarter. He sat the entire time. I think the McBride and Burks minutes were it's more so on the McBride side. I think that should have changed. Um, but hey, I get that you want to stop on the perimeter. Pacers play with more speed. They don't really have that traditional like they have it with Siakam, who's that traditional forward that you could play at the power forward position. But still, I think you need pressures out there who's as mobile and was giving him some fits yesterday. I think that could have been a little bit of like that balancing act that Thibodeau could have used yesterday. I think that's where it all comes down to. But look, as you know, it's not, it's not like the Knicks got outplayed on the offensive board. I think when you look at it at the end of the day, though, it's sometimes you see how the ball bounces and it's like, it's going to you. Sometimes it's not. And I mean, we could look at even the one where, you know, on that last possession, getting back to the Andrew Nebhart shot, it's like, oh my God, could it just fall any better for the Pacers where it's like, <laughs> it's like on the right opposite side. Yeah. It's like, it's same thing. And you could say even for the Knicks where I think about that Nebhart rebound where it just goes off of his hand. He couldn't grab it because it took a funny bounce. And like, that's just how the game unfolds at times and so yeah. it's just you can't control all those things you try to put yourself in the best position but i think when it comes down to like i wish tibbs went back to precious in that starting row that he had him in the starting lineup and close with him and i think at the other thing too is that even though the knicks shot so efficiently especially from three i feel like we kind of deviated from what was working in that first half with dante divincenzo i mean he was just he went nuclear i thought he was gonna get 40 end of the yeah. game with 35 I know he got he was hobbling a little bit towards the end, but you know I think we went a little too far. We went a little too isolation heavy, and then it ga it became instead of moving the ball around looking for better shots, it became too iso heavy, and the ball just got too stagnant in some players' hands. Yeah, and and I you know it's funny I was joking with somebody sitting by me on media row. I said you know we've been making a lot of memes in the NBA world about Anthony Edwards being Michael Jordan. Stop that! It's Divincenzo who should be getting the MJ comps for. <laughs> How ridiculous he was in this game. He was so good. I bum I'm bummed he couldn't get to 40 because he was the best offensive player in the game for a lot of it. Yeah, their offense completely like I don't want to say fell apart. That's harsh. Like I thought they got okay shots in the fourth quarter, but four for nineteen, right? Was the Knicks in the fourth quarter yeah. last night. Like clearly something wasn't clicking as much as it, you know, was early in the game. And Brunson, of course, hit some big ones late, but you know, you mentioned the last possession. Like it's just hard when you're that cold all of a sudden and when they were they were 13 for 20 from three at one point in the third quarter, I tweeted it because for the series at that time, they were over 50 percent from three, which is crazy. Uh, and then they finished 14 for 27, which means they made one of their last seven. And look, I don't I mean, I'm not going to go crazy talking about the quality of threes, but I've watched enough Tom Thibodeau teams. You know, they don't take up threes unless they're good shots. Right. So just they, you sometimes you go one for seven. Right. And sometimes you go 13 for 20. But that's the NBA. So. The, the, the offense was different. That was, I, I do think the Pacers defended better in that quarter. Like that's been a big problem for them this series. And it kind of talks about the rebounding I talked about earlier, but in the second half, they just haven't defended as well. In game one, they gave up 72 points in the second half and that, you know, the game got away from them. They gave up 130 in game two. Like there's only so much you can say about officiating when you're defending that poorly. So to actually step up to the plate on that end mattered too. Uh, that helped a lot, but you know, I just, 
I, I think about that sort of the game being different from games one and two is that second half or where it's been getting away from them. And it helped that the Pacers finally were the ones on the right side of those timely plays. You know, it felt like every time the Pacers would get it within one or two in game two, Brunson double teamed, hits Hartenstein, Hartenstein, DiVincenzo in the corner, three points. Like it's just, it's robotic for them. It's so easy. Right. And so the, the this time to at least disrupt their rhythm in some way that made it so they could be on the right side of those timely plays with, Siakam's block early in the quarter and Turner's block later in the quarter and Emhard's big three. I mean, Siakam hit big shots in the fourth. Like, all that was possible because they defended well in the fourth for the first time in the series, which was impressive because their bench sucked for the first time in this series. Uh, they didn't, Nemhard wasn't efficient for the first time in this series. Like, a lot didn't go their way. Uh, but without OG, they, they found a way. They needed to. It would have been over without it. Salute to Knicks Nation. Thank you all for tuning in for another Game of the Week preview. Appreciate all you. Appreciate everyone tuning in for the preview of Game 4 between the Knicks and the Indiana Pacers. And with me on the other side is my guy, Tony East. He covers the Indiana Pacers for many publications. I can go down the extensive list, but make sure to follow him on Twitter so that way you can go and find all of his work. But he's also the host of Walked on Pacers, so make sure to go check out his work right there. And, of course, I'm your host, Alex Chateras, a.k.a. the Tratocaster. Once again, hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. And support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KFTV. You get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Hey, let me tell you something about Underdog Fantasy. It's a lot of fun, especially when I've been watching these games. Look, I watch a lot of basketball. I think I know something. I'm trying to win some money. So, you know, I like to put a little $5, $10 down. And the cool thing about Underdog is that it is fantasy sports. You can do either the pick'ems or the drafts. So when you go to the pick'em sides, all you got to do is just choose a minimum of two players. Got to be on two different teams. Okay, so you can't choose two Knicks, two Pacers. They got to be on two. They got to be two different team. Two different teams, and then you can choose any statistical category of rebounds, points, assists, the combination of all three, free throws, whatever it may be, three pointers made or missed. However it goes, just choose the higher or lower what you think is going to happen that game, and then maybe you can win some money. And the cool thing, too, about doing the pick'ems is that you don't have to stick to just NBA. You can choose from any sport. So you can make an entire ticket of five players or someone from the NBA, NHL, MLB, golf even. So make sure to check out that and try to get your earnings over there from Underdog Fantasy. And look, if you don't like the pick'ems, you can go through the draft route as well. CKCP, JD, the Knicks chick, and myself, we've all been doing it. Put a little lunch money up. Whoever wins, lunch is on them, or I should say the squad for the next day. So make sure to go support our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. Use that promo code KFTV to get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. All right, getting back to it. So, Tony, we saw what happened in game three and how everything unfolded. I got to get the, I got to get your opinion though on for game four what adjustments is this team making because you know it's are, are you just waiting for now everything just to hit in stride where you're getting the starters you finally get the starters playing well you know they couldn't do it in, Ma in madison square garden but the the bench was doing well now as you as you noted bench didn't show up have we seen the best of the have you seen the best of the pacers yet or are we just waiting for both those things to collide and then really watch this team take off well, they've been waiting for it the whole postseason. Um, you know, they had, the bench was not very good in the first round until the very last game against the Bucks, uh, and then they were great in games one and two. But the starters weren't as good, so they just they haven't had that overlap for whatever reason. Um, their bench was very good in the regular season, mostly. It's different talking about adjustments for a team after a win, right? Like, I right. think you know, like when you win, you want to naturally go as someone covering the Pacers. Like, well, they went to Neesmith on Bronson for a full game. And that worked, right? That looked better. Uh, you know, maybe that if they they'll just stick with that, right? The press has been working all series, and like no OG is not an adjustment, but like that helped Siakam get going. Like all this stuff was a little different in a way that was meaningful. They their sub pattern was different. Ben Shepard came in earlier, and then Neesmith was with the second unit at times, uh, in a in a way that wasn't the case before. Uh clearly the way they were defending Brunson allowed them to recover to everyone else a little better, which they still let even Chenzo go crazy, but uh, Brunson, 10 for 26. I don't know if that was necessarily an adjustment or just Neesmith having a game, whatever. Like, all that stuff went well. They won, right? So it's so easy for them to just go, let's try to do that again. But you have to be proactive. You have to anticipate what the Knicks might try to do and try to counter that or be better at stuff that didn't go well, right? Like, are they going to go to more Jericho Sims or in the next game? Uh, four minutes for him. I thought he might play a little more than that. Uh, but they, you know, they rode with Burks. They rode with those smaller groups. And Deuce McBride played a bunch, like, 
Can they get more size on the floor as the Knicks? And if they do, how do you counter that as the Pacers? Are you prepared to do that? Because a lineup that's been working really well for the Pacers this series is that front court with all three of Siakam, Toppin, and the center. And so that's one way they've been using their size advantage. Just even without OG, that's a lot more effective. So maybe the Knicks try to combat that in some way. And then what do you do if you're the Pacers? And they do. Can they actually find a way to stop DiVincenzo? Can they actually keep part of the boards? Can they be the first team in the NBA to actually find a way to do that? All that kind of stuff is what I'm going to be watching for. But in terms of like major changes, you know, it's not something that comes up as much after a win, after a loss. Of course it does. But that's just kind of the nature of the playoffs and why it's so vital to win the first two because then you're on the front foot for these adjustments when even when you lose a game, you're still ahead in the series, right? So it's a lot easier for the next two have wiggle room to do stuff. For what sure. do you think they're going to do? <sighs> I mean, I think the big thing is like figuring out since Brunson's dealing with his foot injury yeah. and you're seeing how he's getting double quickly. I mean, obviously, Naismith did a good job on him yesterday, forcing him to like really work to get to his position. He rushed Brunson up. I mean, we saw this. I saw this in the first series against the Sixers where Ubre and Batum did a good job of rushing Brunson up and making him a little overthink a little bit or just get a little uncomfortable. What? One, it just starts off with Brunson just getting more comfortable knowing that he's going to get that physicality from, especially being in Indiana, home court advantage is a legitimate thing. So I think he's just going to have to get comfortable with Neesmith. will have a little bit more wiggle room to be more physical with him than in, on the Madison Square Garden floor. So I think him just getting used to that. But also when you're starting to see the double team and working it, how they're just getting after him up high, like as soon as he crosses half court, I think he just got to look for his teammates more and just, as to his, the best of his ability, just relocate and just move the and shift the defense away so that Dante, Hart, all those guys can get better looks and keep them involved and engaged in that offense. Because as the game wore on, when you start to take guys, especially like Don, Dante, who rhythm type player, once you start taking him out of the game, now you're going to ask him to put up shots that, you know, these rush threes, he's falling sideways and or like falling backwards and, that's not how he shoots. He He's a guy who can get off a quick shot, but he has to be set first. So I think something like that, just to get Dante that more airspace that he needs, that's one thing. Second thing I think they're going to look at is saying, hey, we need Precious back on the floor. We don't have OG, as you noted, and that's a big loss. The Knicks have been so good with OG. They've only lost five games when he's been playing, so that Crazy. just tells you how impactful he is. And then without him, they're guy. a sub-500 team. Yeah, yeah, he's he's one he's he's one of your people, man. He's one of your people, <laughs> and so when he's not playing, we're a sub five hundred team. And look, this is still the Knicks were still in it, so it's not they're not too far, right? After all the injuries the Knicks have dealt with up until this point, they're still mm -hmm. in these games, so that's impressive. So they're not too far, but I think Precious being there in the fourth quarter has to be looked at. I think we see a little bit more Burks right now than McBride, just because. This is the first time Burks actually looked decent. And look, Burks had a solid stint the first time he was a Nick. Um, second year wasn't so great because he was asked to be a point guard, not his natural position. But yesterday was the first time this season he looked comfortable and worked in the flow of the offense, not chucking up shots, playing some defense. So I'm happy. And Tony, just so you know, on this show, uh, because it is a call-in show for post game, we had a caller said, put him in the trunk because he's been so bad, right? Put out Burks <laughs> in the trunk. So now... You know, he's finally out of the trunk. Obviously, being inside that trunk, he's learned something like the hyperbolic time chamber that Goku and Gohan have gone into. <laughs> he's come out, looked as a, as a change player, and he's ready to go. So it's good to see that. But as for Jericho Sims, I said this uh, yesterday talking to Alex Golden, who covers the, the Pacers as well for Setting the Pace podcast. Um, you know, I said, I'm not sure how much Jericho is going to play because this season, he's been up and down, and you saw it yesterday, too, in the limited minutes that he played that he got a little lost on defense. So unless he tightens up, I don't see him getting more minutes, and this is why I thought McBride was going to start over Precious. You need that center depth, too, for that second unit. So I wonder if Tibbs is I, – I wonder how Tibbs is going to stagger Precious because you need a competent center out there. I know Harnstein played 39 minutes, but – you don't want to push him too far. So I wonder if you're going to now stagger Precious to make sure they have a good center, especially to compete with Isaiah Jackson for the Pacers. Um, he's been solid so far this series, just rebounding, getting some easy putbacks. That's Those are the three big things I would say for this team is, you know, you got to one, make, Brunson's got to read and get comfortable, find Dante to get him more, more like better airspace on the floor, especially in the fourth quarter. 
you got to get keep precious out there so that way you know you have some height for a rebounding battle and then you know <clears throat> outside of that i think it's just like honestly it's just it just comes down to ex late game execution at this point like there's nothing else more you can ask from from these guys so that's my take on what i think the adjustments will be from the Knicks standpoint yeah, Precious, they need out there, too, because, like, Siakam Turner's a big front court, right? Like, you got to have some size to match up with it. As good as Hart is at, like, forward stuff, right, to be a four, he, he he's given up too much size in that, like, six mm -hmm. inches almost. So, I think that I, – I might be wrong. Siakam's insane shot right before halftime where he put together, like, five moves that I probably couldn't do any of them individually and then <laughs> scored – um, I think that was with heart on him. And like by the time he was shooting, all he had to do is create like no one if you're if you're only listening on audio, <laughs> like and, and you know, six inches of space, and then he can just shoot over him, right? Like that's all he needs. So that's why their size is important, but it's hard to it's hard to do that with who's available for them. And OG was doing a great job on Pascal early in the series. If I'm the Pacers, I'm trying to go to Siaka more. And he was good in this game. Uh game three, twenty six, his best game of this series by far. Uh, and he was huge for the Pacers early in their series against the Bucks. So, you know, it was something that stood out to me, at least during the regular season, is there was a lot of times where the Pacers would realize that their opponent was switching in a way that would get a guard on to Siakam. And the second that would happen, they would just go, all right, post it up. Get it down there to him. We know this is going to be a good shot. And I wonder what they qualify as a guard against the Knicks because I haven't felt like they've done that as much. But mm. he's got a size advantage over a lot of guys. So when Precious isn't out there trying to feed that, Make that a weapon is something I'll be curious about them getting to. Look, if Halliburton can get 26 shots he likes, there's not a lot of offensive adjustments that I think the Pacers need to think about because, that, I mean, that's the second most shots he's taken in an NBA game ever. He took 28 in a regular season game this season and then this one. And I there were, I don't think any of them, I was like, what is he doing? You know, he clearly was, like, going to try to look for a shot in the paint or from deep, and it worked. He had 35. So I can nitpick here and there about, you know, posting up versus Smalls or trying to find a way to get M hard to be more effective. I mean, he was like seven for nine, I think, in game two, right? Like, good stuff. Um, needs to hit half his shots finally. But if Halliburton can find 26 shots, he likes, if he can make 16 threes available to him that are like, yeah, that's fine. You know, he's proven that he can make that. Then there's not a lot they should change. <laughs> they, should, they should keep letting him do that. And so the, it's all kind of defensive stuff. And they allowed 106, so it sounds stupid to say this, but like Nick shot really well from three again, third game in a row. And, like, there's a point where they're shooting so well that it seems like an outlier, but they're getting amazing looks all the time. Credit to the Knicks for that. Their offense is good there. So, finding a way to clean that up. Pacers have been really bad at their closeouts this series. It's not even an adjustment. That's just, like, a play better thing. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, their, their defense needs to be a little more effective. They were better at, like, the four-on-three stuff. Like, Isaiah Hardenstein didn't just completely rip them up in game three like he did in game two where do – you, do you guys have a nickname for his floater? Like, it feels like a shot that should have – a unique name because no one <laughs> maybe it's because he's left-handed but no one it doesn't, doesn't look like any other shot i i see you know the thing is like when we had emmanuel quickly he was the float goat so i think we can't we that that, <laughs> that one has been retired so so we can't really go with the float it's been goat, taken right? yeah it's been taken man he's just and you can't really go with that but yeah i mean it was actually funny last season was discussed at how you have two guys who had solid floors but hey i mean to your point there's not a lot of change you got to you could do after a win. It's like why would you you don't reinvent the wheel when it's been working well, especially in, ga in this game. You gotta game make tweaks, but right, right. Yeah, tweak exactly. You make some minor tweaks here and there. Say, yeah. all right, we got to clean this up. You know, as you as you mentioned, what are the Knicks going to do? How to prepare for that? But it's more so from the Knicks standpoint, where all right, now we got to make the major adjustments. How do we do this? Especially when you don't know when OG is getting back, if he's even back for this series. That's going to be the big determination of how you you move forward. But look. <clears throat> moving forward, I'll say this. You can't sit Josh Hart. You know, we sat out. This is the first time he <laughs> sat in I, so long. He said he sat for five minutes and I'm like, I guess the five minutes was too much. Even with 18 boards, he had 18 boards yesterday. <laughs> five minutes was way too much for this guy because it completely went haywire that he may not never sit again in this series. <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I literally tweeted during the game. Josh Hart is on the bench. That's it. Like the fact that that is a statistical anomaly worth tweeting is insane. <laughs> like, yeah, just, what the heck, man? It's unbelievable. Like even sitting him for five minutes, I, it was mind blowing. I thought he'd be out for like 
because I think Tibbs called a timeout like pretty quick after he came out, and I thought, oh my god, he's gonna put him right back in the game. He didn't. He actually kept him out for a stretch, and they lost by five, and he was a minus eight, so they were minus whatever that is three in that five minute stretch. They lost by three. Like that's a lot of points in a five minute stretch to give up. That's a I can't do math. That's a twenty point loss if that's over a full game. So clear that stretch didn't go well. Um, it, it just gotta. I don't know. It's, it's weird for the Knicks because they have such limited resources, but they've got to not. You can't expend everybody. Straight. Yeah, that's, that's it's, the tough part. Well, it's crazy because like I, Sims played in this game, so I feel bad that I've said this so much. But like Diakite, Jeffries, Milton, and kind of Sims, like are not really playoff guys. So when you're missing four actual rotation guys, it's like you're just out of bodies at some point. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and that's why at this point, it's just mira- it's. Miraculous! It's stunning. It's so impressive for what it's this team so has done, and then the most likable team ever, man. It's awesome. It, which you know, coming from a Pacers, you know, so a Pacers <laughs> fan, someone who covers the team, it's like, wow, this is. We're at a point where even you know, you know, historic rivalries are saying, wow, this is I like like how can you hate for what they're doing? And this is just this is the I say I said this on one of the post games where they truly represent what New Yorkers want to feel behind a team yes. where it's tough, yes. gritty you know, next man up, like all that, all those like, you know, generic sayings, like this team really does. They're such a try hard team where you love it because even it's, and it all starts from like the coach, right. For Tom Thibodeau, who is constantly stuck in his office, figuring things out, watching film, <laughs> like constantly trying to be that mad scientist. And then when you could transfer that same energy to your superstar and Jalen Brunson and is that same way. And then, how is the rest of the team? Can't you follow suit when your superstar is putting in that much work, battling through injury, and then to do to see him do that? Look, man, it's just it's awesome to see. But Tony, I really appreciate you joining me on the show today and helping me preview Game Four and recap Game Three. Please let the listeners know where they can find you if you got any work up and coming. We should be on the lookout for. Yeah, I'm on the Twitter at uh, Tony R East. Looks like Tony Reese. It's my middle name. Whatever. <laughs> um, a lot of stuff coming. We got to talk about Nemhard's shot, uh, and I have a story about Halliburton's best playoff game, and something he said in MSG that made me think a big game was coming from him. I don't want to spoil it, but I had a sense that this could be on the way. So lots mm. of stuff coming. You'll be able to find it all in that feed. Awesome. So I definitely got to check that out because I want to know what he said. I want to know what he said. So <laughs> salute to you, Tony, for joining us today, and salute to Knicks Nation for tuning in for another Game of the Week preview. Make sure to give Tony a follow on Twitter and, and follow his work. Come on, everybody. We're into this. If we're NBA fans, you know we got to get all the coverage we can. We got to know what the opponents are thinking. We got to know what our team is thinking. So that's why we're all tuning in here. And I know we got some Indiana Pacers fans in here. I see you all in the comments section. I know you're all in the chat. Now you're going to talk loud and proud because you got a game. I get it. That's how it all goes. <laughs> how it I goes. totally get it. That's it's how, how it, it gets. I get it. So salute to all of you for tuning in for another Game of the Week preview. Make sure to hit that thumbs up button for your boys. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Make sure to support our sponsor, Underdog Fancy. Use that promo code. KFTV to get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. And make sure to check out KnicksFanTV.com. We got a bunch of great writers over there covering the game and the team as well. So we'll catch you all later. Also, salute to all the franchise channel members and the mods. We'll catch you later. Make sure to tune in for play-by-play tomorrow and post-game as always. All right, everyone. We'll catch you later. We out.